نستعين به ونستغفره ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أرسله بالحق بشيرا ونذيرا بين يدي الساء من يطع الله ورسوله فقد رشد ومن يحسهما فلا يضر إلا نفسه فقال عز وجل يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي اللهم آمين يا رب العالمين أما بعد So today I'm going to continue actually the overview of the surahs <coughs> that I was doing after the Tarawi prayers, the eight rakah. Today I'm going to, over here, try to discuss four surahs. Surah Mursalat, then Surah Naba, and uh, after Surah Naba, Surah Nazia, Surah Al-Abasa, and Surah Taqwir. I'm going to try to do that. So, let me just start. I'm just going to go straight into the Quran, but actually before I do that, let me uh, give you a th an example so that the setting of these of this discussion that the Quran is having is clear. Imagine you're in an island and in this island that you're at there is a castle, right? And you go into this castle and you go into this beautiful castle and everything is there. The dishes are there, the bed is there, the curtains are there, it's beautifully decorated castle. And, and you ask yourself, whose castle is this? Right? I mean, you're in, a, you're in a castle that has so many luxuries, so many benefits, so many functions. Hot water is running, food is coming automatically. Everything's automatically happening. You're in this castle. And you're asking yourself, wow, who owns this castle? And, and then there are some people saying, oh, this castle is not owned by anybody. It's, <coughs> it's just there. And I'm giving a, a, a twist, bit, a modern twist on it. Before it may have been, oh, these pictures or idols own this castle. Nowadays, it's just, it just happens to be here. The beds are just there. And you come up with some theory or some idea of how they just got placed. Maybe a hurricane came and just made the castle by mistake. And then another thing happened and all the bed and all the, the curtains and all the food and everything is just running automatically. You have some theory of how it happens. So here it is. You're in this castle, a very beautiful castle. And you're asking yourself, how did, who owns this? Right? You want to know when you enter a beautiful castle that who owns this castle? I mean, this is a beautiful castle. And so, this is the setting, kind of the type of setting that you find in the, in the, in the beginning of the sixth group that we were talking about. The sixth group being from the surahs that talk about the proofs of the Day of Judgment and the requirements to be to have passed the next, uh, the next in the Day of Judgment, starting with Surah Al-Qaf, ending with Surah Al-Hadid, and then from Surah Al-Hadid to Surah Al-Tahrim. Uh, if you know, I mean, from Surah Al-Qaf to Surah Al-Tahrim. But this one, six, group six, can be divided into two. This first part discusses this very point. Now, when we're talking about the last group, which starts with basically Surah Al-Mulk and goes all the way till Surah Al-Mulk, uh, Surah Al-Nas, in there there's different discussions, but over here where we are, from Mursalat, then Naba'a, then after that Abasa, and then after that Taqweer, the point is that Allah has created this awesome castle. You're like in a castle. And everything is provided for you. Everything is coming to you automatically, right? And Allah is saying, don't you wonder who is doing all this? Don't you wonder who is providing you all this? Like, and it's not a question that you have to analytically answer. That's the point. 
The point is that the reality of that is a priori knowledge. It's already within us. We already know, according to the Qur'an, we already have knowledge about Allah. It's already a priori. What Carl Jung calls the archetypes. The archetypes already exist before a person's born. A person has knowledge of right and wrong before they're born. A person automatically respects knowledge just naturally by being a human. It's a priori. And in the same way, it is a priori that, that we have the knowledge of Allah. For example, Allah Himself says that Allah gathered us and said, Allah to be Rabbikum, am I not your, am I not your Lord? Bala, we said, Yes, well, you are our Allah. So we have the knowledge of Allah within us. So you go into this castle and you're looking at this castle and somebody tells you, you know, this castle is owned by a great king. It should just and if you have a priori knowledge. If you have an a priori understanding and if your heart's clear to give you that message from within, then it's not something analytical you have to do. You just have to look at your heart and your heart will tell you based upon that knowledge that you already have designed within you to say, yes, this definitely belongs to some beautiful king. And so this is the setting that Surah Al-Mursalat starts with. And then after that, the literary beauty that Quran and I, I don't think I'll have time today, but this is you can say the setting, right? And the main theme of Surah Al-Mursalat is Waylul Lil Mukadibin. Woe upon those that deny the truth. How can you deny the truth after seeing such clear things? Right? And and then the beginning is very interesting too, because sometimes Quran says things allegorically. And in, in psychology we know this, it's very, very interesting. If you say things halfway, uh, if you say things partially, and human beings want to resolve conflict, right? So if you give information, partial information, it actually seduces a person, attracts a person into the message. Because you want to resolve the conflict of what is, what is it he trying to say? What is he talking about? And a lot of times, especially in the 30th juz, Quran starts with something allegorical in which a person is not sure what is being discussed. Is it talking about winds? Is it talking about angels? What is it talking about? Right? This allegorical way of pu pulling you into the message. I'll give you an example in psychology. If somebody asks you, what is your name? Right? And instead of answering the question, my name's this, you start with the story. Well, my mom wanted to name me this, and my dad wanted to name me this. Now he's pulled you in by not giving you that answer because you were looking for an answer. You've gotten pulled in. So this is the style that the Quran uses in the beginning. And so just with this introduction, now we quickly, I want to quickly, quickly go over all of the ayat as much as possible. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim, bismillahi ar-rahman ar-rahim, wal-mursalati urfa. And by the winds that set forth for the benefit of humanity. Now, mursalat can also refer to the angels because they're, they're also mursal, they're sent, right? So is it talking, now, if it was an Arab at the time of the Prophet, he probably wouldn't think of angels the first thing. He would probably think of wind or something. But this could be another phenomenon that we haven't even discovered yet. Meaning it yet remains to be discovered. Some phenomenon is being discussed that we haven't even discovered yet. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, wal asifati asfa. And when the winds come with their hurricanes. So there's winds that come with benefit. And then there are other winds that come with hurricane. Look at what happens in Texas every year. And then everything is spread and scattered, right? This word nashara is very interesting. In Urdu we also use the word nashar karna, like when TV turns on, right? To spread everything, right? And when your books open up and give nasha, meaning it could literally mean when your book, when your book of record gives a transmission of everything that you did, like it shows everything that you did. Anyway, that's one meaning. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, And then there's one wind, but it disperses into many other winds. In the same way, could mean angels are going together, and then they disperse with the command of Allah to different directions. And when, it, when the wind comes, it becomes a reminder of Allah's blessing. Or the angels, they come with a reminder, meaning the Qur'an. This thing that Allah sends things like winds or angels, whether to give, in, give you heavenly guidance or Allah sends winds for your worldly benefit. But this is Allah's system that Allah has in place for all of your needs, whether it is, and, and the higher need is hadaya, the higher need is guidance. That's what man needs ultimately. 
Whether giving him an excuse or becoming a blame upon him or, or leaving him rather. Now Allah changes the scene, right? So this was like the, what is Allah talking about? What is this? Is this wind? What is Allah talking about? Right? And now from here, now that Allah has grabbed your attention, now Allah turns to the subject at hand. The subject Allah wants you to really focus on. But the first subject also f forms a purpose, which is to help you think about, look at the winds, right? They are, they, look at the benefit they bring us, right? And, and, and the same way the angels, they're doing in the spiritual world what the winds are doing in the material world, basically. Right? The, the winds move and bring clouds and it rains. And the example the Quran gives of wahi, of revelation, is like it rains. The, the, the earth is dead and then the rain comes and it becomes alive just like this. Allah comes, he, he brings down his revelation and then it becomes alive. The person <laughs> becomes alive. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after mentioning this, then Allah goes to the real subject. And when the stars become dim. So on the, now this is referring to the Day of Judgment, which is the subject of this whole section of the Quran. Particularly in reference to the Quraysh. And this is very interesting because why in reference to Quraysh? One of the benefits of that is every objection that they raised, every objection the Quraysh raised, is, every, is any objection any of us can raise. So by raising their objections and their thoughts and addressing those, you're really addressing everyone's objections. Again, let me go over this quickly because time is running out. And when the sky is broken, like when it's it's opened up, right? Now, this this a lot on the one hand in the next surah you'll see this. This happens in the next surah, and I'll give this as an introduction to that. On the one side, Allah says, look, I've made the mountains, right? And then on the other side, is saying, Allah is saying right after that, when Allah is talking about the Day of Judgment, these same mountains will be moving, right? These same mountains will be moving, like they're, they're, there's no stopping them. They'll be dissolved. Don't you see our sky? It's so stable, how we have constructed it. But on the other side, when Allah is talking about the Day of Judgment, what did He say? Look at how we opened up the sky now. So everything is going in, 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 in opposite to our experience, right? Imagine you're in this palace again, and you're like, what a beautiful palace. All my needs are...